Hi, um, eh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm the director of the Simon Institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, I don't see my slides. Oh, here they are. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to tell, talk to you about today is uh, the impact of cryptography on machine learning uh, research. So uh, essentially uh, basic crypto research, really basic science without any idea of applications, has uh, had a tremendous impact on applications in terms of electronic commerce, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, cloud computing. These days are people are talking about uh, quantum computation and um, coming up with crypto systems which will be secure even with respect to quantum computers. But today I want to talk to you about uh, how cryptography can shed light on machine learning. So in particular, I'm going to talk about three different areas where cryptography is relevant. One is on obtaining privacy uh, while you are training um, um, a machine learning model. And in particular, there's been a lot of work on building prototypes where you can guarantee privacy of the inputs, privacy of the model. But the big challenge these days is how to make sure that things operate when we talk about large scale data. And that will be the first work that I talk about. Uh, and um, the second one, it will address robustness. What I mean about that is how do we make sure that uh, we have accurate predictions when the test distribution deviates from the training distribution? So we may have trained our machine learning model on one distribution, but in practice, when um, things come up in the real world, in the wild, we uh, see completely different distributions of, uh, of inputs. And this could be just because we didn't train our model or with respect to distributions that naturally come up, or maybe the, even the test distribution were adversarially chosen. I think people usually call this um, adversarial machine learning and cryptography can have um, an impact there, especially the point of view of cryptography where you are very used to thinking about uh, adversaries and worst case situations. And the third aspect that I hope I'll get to all of it in the time we have is uh, verifiability. So let's say a machine model has been trained. Maybe um, there's a claim that it's doing very well with respect to certain distribution. How do we verify that? Do we just take that on faith or do we have methods to verify it? So this is work done uh, jointly in three different papers with three different sets of co-authors. Let me start with the first one. So this is uh, work with uh, a Blatt, Gusev, and Paul Yakov uh, that appeared um, in May 2020, 2020 in PNAS. And what we're going to talk about is um, privacy. So we all sort of uh, know kind of the rhetoric that the power of machine learning comes from data, but who's the data belong to? It's data of individuals. And um, in a sense, this means that um, the power that used to be in the hands of individuals is switching to the hands of whoever holds their data. That's true both in terms of training and in terms of classification time. So um, there have been a lot of works of, uh, addressing this in the last four years. They start with visibility results, asymptotic efficiency. They work their way all the way, way up to proof of concept. Uh, but the real issue is what about scale? When we really want to do data-driven analytics, uh, let's say in a health industry and in drug development, we really do need huge amounts of data. This is not where, where the demos or, or proof of concepts were, were uh, optimized for. And often it requires collaboration by different, uh, let's say, hospitals or research centers, each holding a large cohort of data, but not large enough. So we need to figure out how to sort of uh, fuse this data uh, together without revealing it to each other. Um, and if we can do this well, this has tremendous research and commercial benefits. So the first uh, piece of work really is this, is this work uh, on um, a doing GWAS, genome-wide association studies for drug development or for whatever insight development, and uh, but doing it while maintaining privacy. So uh, just a word about GWAS. Um, so this is a so GWAS essentially is an observational study, right, where it involves a large number of individuals. We have access to their genomes and you'd like to identify which genetic variants are associated with specific uh, diseases or traits. And uh, so 
you know, by definition, you know, you need really a lot of um, a, a genetic data by different individuals to come up with these insights. Uh, and each one um, of uh, each um, essentially genetic variation involves about 500,000 to 5 million SNPs and um, where SNP is, uh, you know, a single nucleotide polymorphism, it's a substitution of single nucleotide as, as a specific position of the genome. Um, now, uh, the way that GWAS works, uh, these studies, is that they evaluate one SNP at a time a, a for association with uh, some uh, phenotype, namely a disease, an occurrence of a, dece a, a disease or, or a trait, like having blue eyes or green eyes or whatever. And uh, as you can imagine, that will be ex could be e extremely time um, uh, sensitive or uh, time consuming. And just one other thing is that these days, people, in addition to GWAS, they're doing uh, these polygenic scores, which is take a particular individual, go through their entire uh, uh, genome, and try to figure out, given their particular genetic variations uh, in different positions, what is the risk that they would have for a particular disease. So rather than looking at the entire population and looking for correlation between a disease and genetic variations, look at an individual and a specific genetic variations they have and compute a score. And that's taken a lot of uh, center stage in uh, genomic studies. In fact, it has had if impact for COVID-19 where organizations who store private genomic information are trying to come up with scores of what is the likelihood that you would have a severe form of the disease or even co contact the disease to begin with. So um, this is extremely important, extremely relevant to today with the pandemic. Um, and the question of privacy when you talk about the pandemic, obviously, is not the first question that comes to mind. But you know, we need to remember that this information uh, will later have um, use other uses, could have other uses. And this question of privacy has come up, as I've said. You know, the way things are stored is one snip at a time, a, you know, um, with essentially those that have disease, those who don't don't have disease in comparisons. And people have already had lots of papers about how you could identify personal genomes by um, uh, surname inferences. So so if you have a database that's stored in the multiple databases, some have information attached to them like names, some don't, you can do correlations and figure out a lot more than uh, you think. So in any case, um, this is sort of good news for cryptography because this is really our playground. How do we maintain privacy while we still get the functionality? So in this case, it would be getting the a genomic wide association study done or the polygenic scores. And uh, in the context of GWAS, there's sort of two cryptographic technologies that one considers. One of them is on the left, which is called multi-party computation. And that is you've got a whole bunch of study participants. Um, as you can see here, um, can you see my cursor? I hope so. But in any case, there's study participants. Those are people, let's say, that have um, a, a um, uh, particular genotypes and phenotypes. And instead of giving their information, they do something called secret sharing. So they break it into pieces, let's say to one, two, three pieces. Um, and they give those three pieces to different servers. And the assumption is that the servers don't collaborate with each other to tell each other what their pieces are. But somehow just using a piece, you can do work on the piece, which doesn't reveal the, uh, the secret, but enables you to compute on the piece. And at the end, you just join together the result of your local computations to get the result of the study. So then there's output reconstruction and publication. So the assumption here is that the servers who work on the pieces do not collaborate. On the right hand side, there's a different um, architecture or technology, which is called homomorphic encryption, where again, you've got the study participants, those the guys on the left are the same guys on the right. Um, I'm not sure the right and left are the way you see it. In any case, they actually do not split their uh, information into secrets, but they encrypt them with this special encryption scheme called homomorphic encryption, which enables a, a single server to compute on the all the encrypted information of all the study participants and then come up with a result. And then this gets decrypted. How does it get decrypted? There's a decryption key that lies maybe in the hand of three servers or in specialized hardware. So the difference here is here you split your secrets and you assume that these servers do not collaborate. Here you encrypt. 
So uh, these are two different architectures. And the issue really, when you evaluate which one of these architectures to use is which one scales best. And again, as I said, you need large scale. This was very clearly shown first, I think, in a schizophrenia study where um, um, when they had very few cases, like 3,500 cases, they could not really see any uh, genot any um, a place in the genome that was associated with uh, schizophrenia very clearly. But when the number of cases considered went up to 10,000 and to 35,000, all of a sudden you saw, you saw all these places in the genome which were strongly associated with schizophrenia. And this is not just true about schizophrenia, but on the right, we've got this graph with lots and lots of diseases like breast cancer, like Crohn's disease and so forth. Once you have a large number of cases, you can identify uh, where it is in the, in the genome that, um, that is association with the disease. So scale is very important. So in the past, before our paper, People have used the one uh, architecture where you split the secret into pieces and you have multiple servers, each one working on a piece, and they don't, you assume, you trust them not to collaborate with each other. And it turns out that they got some reasonably good results for uh, sizes like uh, 220K uh, SNPs with 21K individuals and uh, very highly accurate if you compare it to unencrypted. So where you don't split the data, you just work on it in the clear. But they sort of predicted that homomorphic encryption, which has the appeal that you don't have to trust the servers not to collaborate with each other and you don't have to split the secret, will take many years of computation and will be much slower. And I guess the merit of our current work, the current paper, is that we are able... Mm, wait a second. A, what's happening here? We are able to use homomorphic encryption to do... Um, a GWAS a, and um, for larger number of people, for much, uh, for 26K, for 260K SNPs, but that's not so important. The point is that we can um, show that the methods would scale up in the sense that in simulations, um, the accuracy against is very high. And, uh, the, and by uh, extrapolation, the runtime for, let's say, chi squared tests will be a few hours rather than like five hours rather than 193 hours in prior studies of the previous slide, and same for logistic regression, which would be like 234 hours where it was practically impossible in the split secrets and methodology. So that, that is big news. This means that we are approaching what can be done in the wild, what should be done on at scale using homomorphic encryption. So let me skip ahead because I want to get to the other two uh, topics of robustness and verifiability. Uh, I guess maybe this is the more interesting slide which tells you about scaling, that we can scale way beyond uh, what we uh, know how to do now in terms of the number of individuals and in terms of the number of uh, uh, SNPs, and, um, and that's good news. Okay, so, um, sorry, I went backwards instead of forwards. Uh, I guess this is not just for GWAS, there are these libraries out there now, these uh, homomorphic encryption libraries, which use a lot of engineering optimization in addition to theory to uh, be able for you even to build some um, application like logistic regression on the kind of, if it's not medical data, other kind of data and use the library uh, to guarantee privacy. So the next topic I wanna to talk to is about robustness. So robustness, what do we mean here? This is paper with, um, Yael Kalai, uh, Adam Kalai, and uh, Omar Montessar, for was a student in University of Chicago, uh, actually in, in Toyota Institute. And uh, the issue here is that um, when we design a machine learning algorithm, we already know that it's possible that if you had access to the algorithm, if it was white box access, that means you could see the internals of the machine learning algorithm, but black box means you could just put inputs and get outputs, you can very quickly learn how to feed it inputs that will completely fool it. Where humans would do the right decisions, you know, the machine learning algorithms just will do something completely incorrect. However, uh, so how do you battle this? So there's lots of work on this and the current approach really is to say, well, we know the domain of attacks. We know really what adversaries do. They do shifts, they do rotates. Let's say if we're talking about an image, they rotate the image and, and so forth. If this is the class of attacks, we know how to protect against it. But as a cryptographer, we're saying, how can you know what the class of attacks is? The whole point of an adversary is that you don't know what they're doing. So we would like to get um, 
in a guarantee with respect to arbitrary deviations from uh, what we know, what we trained our algorithm to recognize. So if you think about uh, the original definition of machine learning by um, Les Valiant in the theory community, he says you're given data from distribution P, and let's say it's labeled by some function, and you want to come up with a hypothesis that sort of makes the right prediction uh, with high probability. But again, with respect to what distribution, the same distribution P that you were trained on. But um, that's not always the case. And that's exactly the case that we don't have where the train and test distribution are different. So let's look, look, look at an example here. The example is uh, we have pluses and minuses and we, somebody tells me that there's a line that separates the pluses and minuses and asks me to find the line. So let's say this line works. And uh, let's now say that this was how I trained my algorithm and I came up with H to be the model that separates pluses and minuses. And then the real test distribution comes in. Those are the black dots. And they're distributed the same as terms of plus and minuses. Everybody's happy. There's good success here. But suppose that the black dots, the training, would come and they um, and instead of being distributed like, the, uh, sorry, the, te the testing, instead of like being distributed as in train time, let's say that a lot of the points would be lying here. Uh, then how would you be able to tell whether those are pluses or minuses? You've never seen them during training. It could go either way. Right, so it's impossible. You know, you can prove very easily that's impossible. So, um, question that we try to address in this work is: What do you do when the testing distribution, the thing that the black dots, are very different from the training distribution, the pluses and minuses that came during training, and which your algorithm are trained according? And this is not just a magical hyperplane uh, toy example, but this happens. You know, if we think about you know, all the statistics about not recognizing uh, women and especially dark-skinned women uh, because they didn't train on them. Um, a, and um, a, even worse, uh, it's not just that you didn't have access to data, but adversarially there might be offensive videos in YouTube that try to, you know, pass through the YouTube screen that they don't recognize that they're offensive uh, in clever ways. So our new work uh, is um, has two deviations from what was done before. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the learner to abstain. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that he doesn't have to say plus or minus. He may say, I don't know. So um, in the region where you've never seen examples, if the test, the, the small dots come in and they ask you to classify them as a plus and minus and you have no chance of doing it, you say, I don't know. So this has been considered before. But people uh, considered it uh, and wanted to show results uh, when um, the test and and um, and train distribution uh, were still the same. What we show in this new work, and I'm, I have only a minute and a half, so I'm going to start wrapping up. What we show in this new work, let me skip ahead, is that if you added one more thing. You add, you allow the learner to abstain. So it's illegal to say yeah, plus, minus, or I don't know. But in addition, you give it a sample of these uh, new distribution. So let's say you were trained on P, but in test time you get Q. Um, you are able now to do extremely well. So in other words, I'm going to both allow you to abstain and I'm going to give you for free some examples of what's coming. Is that reasonable or not? Sometimes, you know, you can imagine that in retrospect, you fix your uh, predictions, or you can imagine that you get, uh, you know, your test as a batch and you have a chance to consider them. And in any case, if this is the case and you can get both um, this example of the test uh, questions ahead of time, uh, and you're allowed to say, I reject, I have absolutely no idea, I abstain, we can get very, very good guarantees. So we can get um, very low, uh, we will answer correctly on distributions we were trained on, and we will abstain often on the distribution we were not trained on, but when we don't abstain, we'll have very low error. So we can analytically prove that. Uh, the, how, how much we reject on when we should not reject, plus how much we err when we could err. Layla Euclid is um, um, uh, a bounded by this, by this factor. Okay, I really have no more time. So this is sort of good timing 
because I am done with two of my papers. <laughs> so I talked about privacy, I talked about robustness, I did not talk about verifiability. And it's my pleasure. Next time. Thank you.